good. Uh, that is true. My name is Justin Baker. Um, I suppose I do consider myself some living proof that you don't have to be a monk to meditate and get something out of it. Uh, without getting too deeply into my backstory, I am a hyper competitive, uh, hyper driven uh, person who does not like to sit still. Uh, I have, I was thinking of, and by the way, thanks to uh, Liz before us, that was a great, that was a great story. It made me think about my own backstory a little bit. I too have served my time in the corporate world, uh, in the fast paced and nasty world of advertising. Um, I've been a competitive Division I athlete. Uh, and I have spent years and years um, trying to figure out what to do with my life and having family members and friends saying, what the hell are you doing with your life? <laughs> I've been to all those places. And uh, my adventure into meditation has helped me reconcile a lot of those things. Um, let's see. First, first thing, a couple of ground rules. Um, I know when, it, when meditation gets brought up, a lot of people, I was even just looking at the offers and needs uh, board and I came in, and a lot of people had questions about meditation or yoga. I teach these things, and this is participatory, even if I stand up here and talk of it. If you have questions about meditation or anything bring up, feel free to yell them out. I may not answer them right away, <laughs> but uh, if I don't answer it during this talk, then you can talk to me after. I love helping people with this stuff. Um, I assure you, I was the last person in the world that anybody thought would be able to sit still for days at a time and meditate. So if you try this and you have struggles with it, uh, definitely come talk to me at some point if I don't answer your question. Uh, for the most part, that's what this is about. Um, it's about the fact that I do, these days, spend a lot of my time going around and teaching meditation, teaching yoga, and developing mindfulness-based programs for everyday people. Um, we do stuff with uh, organizations, we do stuff uh, with educators, school teachers, educational administrators. Uh, I train athletes for performance reasons. Um, so I encounter a lot of people to whom this is challenging or foreign or difficult. And, and I, it's still something that we struggle with. What is the best way to deliver this? It's a very, it's a very big and a very complex topic. It uh, comes from a very old tradition. And uh, who's ever heard the word mindfulness before? All right, okay, right. So no one's living under a rock? <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> Um, anyway, over the last 15, 20 years, this has been imported into the West in uh, some very stripped down forms. And I think there's been, there's been some difficulty in the translation, and that's sort of, uh, sort of what we're getting at here. So, any questions before I begin? All right. Um, so we will, do, we will practice a little bit of meditation here. We will talk about it. Um, well, let's start by practicing a little bit right now. Is everybody up for that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, raise your hand if you've meditated before or attempted to. Good. That's what I thought I was getting. <laughs> that's fantastic. So if you have any stuff in your hands, why don't you put that down? Um, everybody's hands are pretty good. So the next thing you're going to do is close your eyes down. Since you guys can't see me, I'm going to sit down too. Good. Find a comfortable place for your feet and for your legs, some place you think you'll be comfortable sitting for a few minutes here. And find a comfortable place for your hands to rest. Good. And then let's just begin by noticing some simple physical sensations. Notice what it feels like where your feet meet the floor. Just observing the basic physical sensation there. Notice what it feels like where your hands are resting wherever they happen to be resting. Maybe notice what it feels like where your legs make contact with the seat. Notice the specific points where your back happens to be leaning against the chair. And at that juncture, you may also notice that you happen to be breathing. So 
go ahead right now. Draw in a little bit of intentional breath. Take in a little bit of air. Feel the crown of the head reach ever so slightly toward the ceiling. Feel that spine straighten just a bit. And then out breath. Let the shoulders come down. And let the chin come down a little bit with it. Make sure you're not holding any tension in the neck or shoulders. So you have a feeling of being alert and upright, but also relaxed. And allow the attention to come fully inward. And see if you can just notice the natural occurrence of the breath. allowing the breath to occur naturally, as it happens to be right now. Noticing if it happens to be shallow or deep. If it happens to be long or short. taking note of where in the body you feel it the most. Do you notice it down in the belly? Do you notice it more as the chest rises and falls? Notice it more in the back of the throat or entering the nose. Wherever you happen to notice it in particular, try to further hone your attention on that particular space. See if you can direct the attention to just notice the bare physical sensation happening in that one area as the air comes in and as the air goes up. mind happens to become distracted by a sound, by a sensation somewhere else in the body, or even by a thought, do your best just to observe that distraction, allow it to pass when it's ready. and simply redirect the attention to the target, the breath. And 
be getting out. See if you can observe seven consecutive breaths. on that particular area you've been paying attention to without interruption. the end of seven breaths. Take your hands and slowly start to rub them together. Just generate a little bit of warmth in between the hands. Take the warm hands, place them over your eyes. When you're ready, let the eyes open into the hands. And then slowly pull the hands down, let the light back in. The hands thing is for the bright room. Um, so, uh, by show of hands, um, whose mind was a perfect sea of tranquility. Okay. Uh, did anybody achieve unity with the universe just now? <laughs> Nobody? I did not get to seven. <laughs> I got lost. It's pretty typical. Uh, well, I'm sorry I failed you guys. Four shots ago. Just kidding. Uh, before we start chatting too much, um, if you have a writing utensil and something to write on, while it's still fresh in your mind, take a moment. And since some of you apparently had your minds elsewhere now and then, uh, write down some of the things that crossed your mind, some of the things that distracted you from the breath. Um, all right, guys. Anybody want to? Anybody want to blurt out a few on this for my amusement and everyone else's? Yeah. Just think about my belly button. It's just like picturing it. It's like a weird looking thing. Yeah. Any or Abby? What? Any or Abby? Uh, any. Alright. <laughs> Anyone else? Oh my gosh. Are they okay? Yeah, they're doing fine. Yeah, they got some water. Yeah. Good, okay. They're a little worried about it. Just get distracted. I care about my dogs a lot. Yeah. Anyone <laughs> else? I need less caffeine because I like to feel with my heart beating instead of my breathing. <laughs> oh, I know. I know, right? Like, what are these meditation retreats when they offer coffee and tea? It's like, how do people do that? Yeah. I have like three sips of tea, I can't sit. <laughs> I can't sit with zero cups of tea. Um, so what you're going through, so that's very typical. Um, oh wait, I don't have to do that, I have technology. Let's see if it works. Woo, all right. Okay, so as mentioned, I teach, uh, I teach a lot of people who are not hardcore meditators, a lot of people who are beginners. Um, and what we find in doing this, when I say we, sorry, I have a business partner and we teach in groups a lot and we do this for a lot of people. Um, we find there are basically three groups of people. Um, and there are this group of people who say, I can't sit still, I don't get it, why am I paying attention to my breath, what the hell is this, what are you, why, why are we doing this, I don't get it. Anybody in that group? It's, no, there's nothing wrong with that. Wouldn't surprise me. I didn't, I can't believe I tried it the first time. Um, then we get a lot of people in this, this trying group. Uh, two possibilities. One is they were curious, they tried it, and they had a positive experience. Thought, hmm, you know, that felt good. I had a, I felt calm, I felt a little less stressed, I felt a little more clear-headed. This is cool, how do I get more? What do I do now? And then they come to us and we give them some ideas and they say, well, that was great when I was taking your class for eight weeks and then I went and, God, I couldn't keep it up. I couldn't make it part of my routine. I feel like I've plateaued, I don't know what to do now. And uh, in this group I'd also put people, maybe they've got a real problem and they're saying, I, 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 have, I have trouble sleeping, or you know, my doctor 
told me I should try this. Actually, this was a true story. I was at a wedding this past weekend, and a good friend of mine, same age as me, 35 years old, uh, had a heart attack. 35 years old. And I, had, I didn't know this. I hadn't seen him in about two years. And he said, you know, my doctor told me to try meditation. He's like, I, I know I should do it, but it's like, honestly, it's boring. It's like flossing. <laughs> and I, I, I can see how that would happen. I mean, honestly, I think flossing is probably more rewarding because you, you immediately feel like you have a clean mouth. You can meditate for like three weeks and get nothing out of it. You're like, why the hell am I spending 20 minutes doing this every night, right? Um, and then, you know, there are those people. Does anybody know what those people? <laughs> yeah, is anybody of those people? We don't have any of those. You're that girl staying alone? I'm, I'm right teetering. Are you a yoga teacher? No. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes, it, okay. So I, sometimes I tell people what I do, and they're like, oh, God, are you a yogi? <laughs> <laughs> no. Um, sometimes I get put in that category, but I'll tell you, I, I find myself in the trying category, too, even though I've been doing it for five years. Um, and I think this is the dilemma uh, for people who are trying to bring this practice into the West. Uh, I think it makes sense that this is happening because um, what are some of the reasons you're interested in meditating? Just throw some things out. Less stress. Less stress, I know. Patience. Patience. Focus. Focus. Superpower. Superpower. <laughs> the ability to meditate or because you get superpowers after you do it? There are some superpowers, yeah. I can read your mind right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that makes sense. I, I think if you, if you take like the straight Buddhist literature or Hindu literature, and you say, well, we're going to achieve unity with the universe. And you come to the United States, and I like say that to a football team or a room full of school teachers. And they're going to look at me like I'm nuts. <laughs> so I think, we have, I think the approach that's been taken to bring meditation to the West, it makes sense. I mean, we kind of have to give people this list and say, hey, here's the reason you should try. This list looks pretty familiar, right? Reduce, yeah, and you guys probably mentioned one of these, and then you know, maybe it'll make you more productive and think more clearly. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's my business partner, Jen. Isn't she, isn't she adorable? Oh. She's a, that's in front of Lake Calhoun. Um, that was for a different class we were teaching, but maybe not. Um, like I said, I think it makes sense to teach that way. Uh, but it does, it does divorce the act of meditation from its original home, which is embedded in a much deeper set of practices and philosophies and rituals. And like I said, those, I think those cause a problem and they're going to deter people from trying it. Um, but then, you know, that leaves, and I, I wrestle with this myself, so then what's the way to do it? Because if you just sell these benefits, you're going to have people who A, don't experience the benefits at all. You're going to have people who B, experience some of the benefits, but then aren't sure exactly what to do and what to do next and then where to go with it. Because uh, these are, they are push-ups. You can think of them as push-ups for your brain and they will help you. But something can get lost and I think we end up with this result when we approach it that way. So my task for you guys today is to sort of maybe break down the wall a little bit and see if we can find a middle ground where the practice has a deeper meaning. But it's still practical enough for us to do it. Um, I think this is the big problem, right? So, okay, let's talk about the deeper meaning. The deeper meaning is liberation, or to be totally released from suffering, or to experience oneness, or to break down the illusion of selfhood. Anybody ever heard like terms like that? Mm -hmm. Right. And then maybe you pick up, maybe you're interested in meditation, you pick up uh, the Satipatthana, or you learn about the, no, the Eightfold Noble Path, and then you go, oh my God, really? <laughs> I have to give up drinking? <laughs> I have to give up everything. I've got to go live in a. I have to go live in the mountains. This seems impossible. I guess I'm just gonna, you know, take my mindfulness-based stress reduction course at the University of Minnesota and call it a day and hope that I'm nicer to my spouse. I think there is a way around this. Um, so we're gonna do. Uh, bear with me. We're gonna do a slight history lesson because I think that's where we're gonna find the answer. Um, but like I said, I keep shouting out questions if anything I'm saying isn't making sense. So like I said, these traditions are very old. Uh, 3,000 years, give or take. Um, I think those pictures are ancient China and ancient India. I'm going to go with that. But they're not as distant from us as we might think. 
uh, their world was modernizing, their material existence was improving, uh, advanced food production techniques, they're living in more densely packed areas. As a result, there's time for people to think and read and write. Uh, a lot of things are happening, but of course there are drawbacks to modernization as we all know. Uh, the benefits of modernization are not uh, being distributed equally among everybody. Um, and of course, even though we're more, we have better homes, better stuff, we're not necessarily all happier. Has anybody ever seen that stat where Americans are like we're number one materially in the world and we're like 37th in terms of fulfillment and happiness? Right, so they're going through the same stuff. And there's, and so since there are thinkers and there are wise guys sitting around rubbing their chin saying, hmm, they're saying, hey, this, this suffering, there's a universal suffering that comes with being human. No matter what we do, no matter how well we change our external environment, there's still something wrong in here that we haven't been able to fix. And a lot of guys, a lot of wise guys, they came up with a few big things. Okay, attachments. You're born, what's the first thing you do? Cry. <laughs> Why are you crying? You're hungry, you're tired, you need a hug. Right? And this, and this is how the human body is wired. You're wired to crave things. It's the only way you get what you want. Your body tells you to get food so that you get food and you, and you live. And this is very much how our physiology works. And so we grow up this way from, from the second we're born and we develop kind of permanent cravings. Right? We prefer to live X, Y, and Z or we permanently crave attachment to other people or food and we get accustomed to living a certain way and become attached to these ways. So okay, that's part of the problem, but that's why we keep building better environments. If we just get a perfect house and a perfect world, we won't, well, everything will be cool, but that doesn't work because nothing in the world is, nothing in the world is permanent, right? You can fall in love with the perfect person, be with that person for a given period of time. Even if you guys live to be 100, eventually you're both gonna die. Eventually, you're going to be separated from the love of your life. So nothing in the world is permanent. So we're wired to crave things and to be attached to things and to, be, and to avoid other things and to be averse to certain things, but none of these things are permanent. So, and there's nothing, these, these are universal truths. There's nothing we can do about either of these things. So that's universal suffering. We all have these cravings. We all have these aversions. And all of the conditions which we are attached to, or, or avoiding, they're all perfect. And you're like, this is it. We figured it out, we figured out what causes suffering, we're just gonna write some books, we're gonna tell everybody it's gonna be fine. <laughs> everybody get it now, you're all happy? Right, inner peace just by reading that? I know, right? So that's what they did. They go around and they started teaching. They're like, hey guys, this is how the world works. Stop being so miserable. Stop fighting. Stop taking your issues out on other people and starting wars and being a jerk and hoarding all the wealth and like, you know, hitting on the other guy's wife. Like, don't covet stuff. It's not worth it. Right? And they figured out there's one huge problem uh, ego. Mm -hmm. Right? At a very young age, all of these cravings, all these things become totally merged with our identity. Right? Who thinks they could describe their personality in a paragraph? Nobody? Okay, good for you guys. <laughs> Three paragraphs, four paragraphs. Could you describe somebody else's personality? <laughs> right? You could, theoretically, if, you are, uh, if you're reading a lot of clinical psych literature, uh, break down personality to a series of preferences. And this is what the wise men were saying. Our preferences get so built in from the day we're born that we merge with them and we don't even think of them as preferences. I just, I am a carrot chaser. It was, in, it was in my intro. Justin is a highly motivated blah 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 person. And it's just like, where did that come from? Where did that come from? It starts that it starts that young and we develop this self-identity. I'm, and you wake up and you get out of bed and you're like, I'm Justin Baker and I'm gonna go work because I work hard and I'm gonna get my stuff and people think this of me so I'm gonna act this way. And we all, this is, this is ego. And it's, it's all tied in, it's all tied into these attachments that form during age. And they're like, okay, so here's this 
here's this like straw man that lives inside all of us. And if people could just see, it's a series of physiological reactions happening. These guys all fancy themselves scientists. They studied the, they studied the earth and the water and the stars. They just didn't have instruments, but they had a pretty good intuitive understanding of this stuff. We're made of the same stuff as the earth. We're a bunch of physiological reactions. We are born by taking in resources from the world and we die, it's you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, we're going back into the world. We're all part of this endless universal cycle of birth and death. But all of a sudden, we're like, no, I'm separate, I'm me, I'm a thing. And don't mess with my thing and don't touch my wife. <laughs> right? So they had to figure out a way around this. They had to figure out a way for people to see the truth themselves because you can't tell somebody that. So all these traditions of meditation that was their goal. So they started doing all these crazy things. Guys would go live in the desert and not eat for like months and months and months to try to rid themselves of cravings and to destroy the ego and the self. And they would meditate and they would do all this crazy stuff. Um, and then apparently, some guy named Gautama Buddha, he sat under a tree one day and just became enlightened. And he's like, guys, 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 I figured it out. I figured out what we have to do. Here are the austerities. Here are the types of meditation. I understand how the sense doors work and where the sensations come from and how they, how they construct the ego. And if you meditate this way, you'll be released from suffering. Look at me, Psh, enlightened. <laughs> anyway, our teaching, and if you read, and when you pick up the, the books, that's what you'll read. Um, and ha I, have, I have gone through uh, some, pretty, you know, some pretty dense traditional training. It's called Vipassana. Um, and I would have to say the teaching is pretty good. It works pretty well. I have experienced the straw man of my ego here and there, but then, you know, I walked out, I came back, and I'm like, I'm Justin, leave me alone. But I've been it. So here's the, here's the problem. Uh, yes, this, there's this path, but who do we really know who's become fully enlightened? Like, why would we go after something that's basically impossible, right? Is nobody here is going to go live in, and even if you do go live in a cave, there are people doing it right now. They're still, they've been sitting there for 30 years trying to get enlightened. It's not happening. Um, anybody ever heard of the novel Siddhartha? Anybody read it? Remember the part where he goes into the grove and he meets Buddha? So Siddhartha's on this spiritual journey. His dad's a Brahmin. He's like, ah, organized religion is bunk. I'm going to go on my own. I'm going to go live in the desert with the ascetics and fast. And that doesn't work for him. And then he meets Buddha. And he hears Buddha's teaching. He says, I'm paraphrasing. It's like, dude. <laughs> best teachings I've ever heard. I've, made, I've been meeting all these guys for years and years and years. You're the best teacher. There's no question about it. You are clearly enlightened. I would love to follow your teaching. I got one problem. And he's like, yes, man. Say, what do you got to say? It's like, you're the only one who's become enlightened. I see a hole in your teaching. <laughs> and Buddha said, you're a smart guy. It's like, what? That's all you got to say? <laughs> so I just, uh, you know, be careful that you're not thinking too hard about this young man. And that was it. And he said, well, this Buddha guy, man, I'm out of here. <laughs> but that's the same thing. He's going through the same thing. It's like, it's true. You can go through this. And you're like, okay, I get it now. But this is still really hard. I still have this gigantic mountain to climb. What am I going to do about it? All right. Whoops. Get cut. Okay. So we're going to try a solution. What do we got? Okay. We're good on time. Um... Everybody remember this? Okay, we're going to try another meditation exercise. So, drop yourself again. This one will be a little different than what we did before. Any questions so far? All right. All right, so let's let those eyes close down again. Good. Let that body settle into the seat once more. Again, let's begin to locate the breath. Allowing the attention to draw inward.
And noticing once again that you have the ability to simply observe the activities of the breath. Allowing the air to come in and leave entirely on its own. And using the observance of the breath, as a tool to attract your attention as it continues to draw inward. And allowing the attention to settle to an even deeper place. from which all activities within the body are simply natural occurrences which may be observed. Like anything else, the breath can be observed simply as a sensation without judgment without cause, without criticism. The breath simply is. And from the hub at the very center of the mind, we are able to observe. From this hub at the center of the mind, you may also observe thoughts passing. They may arise and pass like clouds. They may jar you more like rocks. They may stream past like water. Whatever they may be, simply observe them. And now for a moment, Recall the question you answered at the very beginning. Recall the thing you really want. Allow that to come up from memory. And see if any images happen to come with it. See if any sounds come with it. Perhaps any tactile sensations. So allow those associations to come up. And notice if any feelings arise with that also. Notice if this thing that you really want, or this experience that you really desire, notice if it elicits a feeling within you. And 
again, just observe from the hub of your awareness. Maybe where that feeling is located in the body. Does it have a particular signature? Does that feeling have a particular size or a particular shape? Observe that feeling like a scientist with curiosity without judgment. Spend another moment with that feeling. Again, doing your best to simply observe without judgment. And when you're through observing, return your attention to the breath. feelings to pass naturally. Bring all the attention back to the sensation of the breath. Back to the present. To the feeling of air as it comes in and as it goes out. as it goes in, and as it goes out. And when you feel as though you are fully back in the present with the breath, slowly and when you are ready, allow the eyes to open. take you to develop that cadence. It's not like you're interrupting anything, so it's like the perfect time. <laughs> Thanks, that's a guess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just a lot of practice. Yeah, a couple of years probably of doing it almost every day. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, I felt the same way, like the, the questions and all that. I mean, I've seen places where you can just download a recording or something. How do you ask yourself that, like, those questions when you're meditating by yourself? Uh, my answer may sound like a fortune cookie, but the questions will ask themselves. <laughs> <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> um, you, can, you can do record. Uh, guided meditations are good when you're learning. Um, and there are millions of them out there. Talk to me later, I'll recommend it to you. Um, for starters, was that different than the first meditation? Yes. Did uh, did that evoke a feeling for most people? Yes. And did that feeling have a sensation in the body for most people? Okay. Uh, would you say that whatever that feeling was in the body, has it passed now? Or is it still lingering? Interesting. Okay. So, what I did was a, a little bit of manipulation, so apologies, okay? Um, but I 
This is something, like you said, you're saying, how do I do that intentionally? So what happens when you do true insight meditation, you, uh, you work your way through the sense doors into the body, and you realize that the feelings evoked by your cravings and your aversions have a physiological signature in the body. This is one of the, this was the supposed enlightenment of Buddha, this particular way of meditating that you would notice these things. Now normally, like I said, you'll sit and you'll practice for periods of time, and these things will just happen. And you'll realize over time, wow, these feelings, they come and go. And they have certain qualities, they have certain universal qualities. And you're learning the reality of the self. You're peering into the self to see what is the nature of these feelings, what is the nature of these cravings. And so we learn universal qualities when we do meditations like this. One thing constantly changes. Has anybody noticed that their thoughts are not the same all the time, right? <laughs> this is true. They are temporary. No thought stays forever. Also, agreed? Yes. Uh, the people often refer to the monkey mind. Mind is like monkey. It goes away and runs three to three. You do not get mad at monkey. Monkey is monkey. Um, Physical events, so these things happening over your body, which is sort of what we just did there, which I was, again, manipulating you into feeling. <laughs> right? Constantly changing. Temporary. Not totally under your control. So if I were to track back again. All right, so the supposed liberation that we serve, that we seek, is to understand the universal truth of impermanence. But every time you do this, you are directly experiencing the universal truth of impermanence of the self. You are directly experiencing the illusion of the self. You had a feeling, it was there, it was in your body, it was actually mostly a physical sensation. Yes? And then you went back to the breath, and it, that sensation started to fade. You experienced the illusion of self, it just happened. You guys all just became enlightened. <laughs> Congratulations. So, you know, like I said, this, this is not something that will happen automatically. It won't just happen in five minutes. But I think, perfect. perfect. So, in this, I'm stealing this particular idea from another guy um, whose name I'm forgetting. There you go. I just failed to give him credit. I'll remember it later. Um, but the spirit of there's this long path. Which if you really try to take, if you try to take your meditation to the next level, you will inevitably encounter this idea that meditation is this impossibly long path. You will meditate for your entire life, and you will slowly shed the weight. And then you'll die, and then you'll be born again, and you'll start over, but you'll be in a better place when you're born again. So in you know like 10, 15 generations, you'll get there. <laughs> but the universal truths are not that complicated, and you can experience them every time you sit. And I think that's the thing that gets glossed over. Am I enlightened? No. But I can sit for 10 minutes and realize that my mind has a whole lot of crap going on in it. And that some of it isn't real. It's just an activity going on in my mind. And everybody is capable of that. Get to that in a second. But this is all, these words get so big, the uh, release from suffering, et cetera, et cetera. But you can, you can touch your suffering. Now, I was nice enough to do kind of a, hopefully what you desire is kind of a positive thing. Was it for most people? Positive aspiration? Okay, good. But you'll have times where there's something intense and negative going on inside your body, right? And in that moment, you can use what we just did to come directly into contact with that suffering. And you may realize after practicing the way we just practiced that that suffering is a sensation going on inside of your body and it's constantly changing and it's temporary and it may not be that real. It may be a creation going on inside of your body. And if that's true, well then what's all of your suffering, right? And so... I think, and this is, this is my pitch, this is my 10 cents on meditation, I think there is a way to have a little tiny bit of enlightenment on a regular basis. 
a little a little tiny bit of release from suffering. And any, I, I would recommend trying it. Anytime you are suffering in some way, try what we just tried. Some thoughts on that. Um, when you hear the word mindfulness, what you're hearing is basically being in touch with reality. Uh, anybody ever tried transcendental meditation or anything like that? Doing mantras. Nothing against those. Those are great. They're very great. They're great for focusing the mind. Um, the meditations I'm talking about are getting in touch with the reality going on inside your body, observing the reality exactly as it is, observing the breath as it is, observing the sensations in the body exactly as they are. That's how you encounter the reality of the self. Anything that fits that definition could work for what I'm talking about. Um, anybody ever met a monk or seen a monk or gone to see the Lama speak? These guys laugh all the time. And I, I didn't understand that when I was 20 years old. I understand it now. Do you know why they're laughing? Because they realize that they're nuts. <laughs> All this stuff going on in here is bizarre. The universe is a crazy place, and we're just like living in it. And it's funny. I promise. Be patient with yourself, have a sense of humor. Um, sitting and meditating is not the only way to do this. I highly recommend trying other things. Yoga, done a certain way, can definitely be a practice which gets you which gets you in touch with reality. Read books. Try it any it like can come from anywhere. See a movie, go for a walk, climb a mountain. I've seen I've I've taught a lot of people and everybody finds their truth in a different way. We're all different. Um, Buddha said there was one path. But there are a lot of ways to get there, I swear. Promise. Anything else? Um, oh yes, and if you dare uh, try what I did, which I guess I do not recommend for everybody. Old tradition called Vipassana, um, and I meditated silently for 10 days, 10 hours a day, my very first try. I didn't even sit in a room like this and have somebody teach me. I didn't know what I was getting into. It was a deep dive into the abyss. It was hard, but if you think you could survive it, I highly recommend it. And if you want to ask me about that, go ahead. Um, lastly, modern sage. Uh, one of my favorite quotes. So he, even he noticed, hey, you know, he's doing physics all day, and he's like, you know what, this reality, kind of an illusion. But here's my favorite one. <laughs> so I will leave you with that. <laughs> Go home and make an apple pie. <laughs>